Please open in your Bibles to the book of John. As you've heard this morning, we're going to be starting this series, and I've entitled it Good Faith because that's exactly what John wants to encourage as we will go throughout the book of John, and in fact, as we will even hear this morning, the entire goal of this book is to encourage good faith. John shows us our need for a Savior. He shows us our glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he tells us, he gives us the one response that is necessary for us to receive the salvation that Christ is offering to us, which is to believe. We need to have good faith. So that's what John wrote about in this entire book. And that's what we're going to be hearing about this morning. If you're using the Pew Bibles in front of you, you can find it on page 886. As we go throughout this Uh, chapter today, this little section of the book, and through the rest of the book, what I hope you encounter is a a man who is going to write with the heart of a pastor and the passion of an evangelist. He earnestly wants his hearers, which would include us today, he earnestly wants his hearers to believe and trust in Jesus. And so he begins his book with one of the most profound portraits of Jesus that we find anywhere in the scriptures. You can think of it a little bit like John this morning giving us Jesus's origin story to inspire us to believe in him and to trust him. And that's a pretty great thing for us in our day because we in our culture love a good origin story, don't we? We love hearing how scrawny Steve Rogers becomes the powerful Captain America. We love hearing how organizations have overcome all of the challenges of their startup to become something amazing, how Facebook began in a dorm room or something like that to become this kind of global thing. Origin stories are powerful to us. We, we like hearing about a good origin story. They, they instill us with this, uh, this almost mythical significance When we hear of this uh, ascendancy and overcoming of the great challenges that these people endured, we, we sense in this organization or person a power that we want to follow. We want to buy into it. We, we want to trust them because clearly they know what they're talking about if they've been able to become this amazing thing from the, uh, the challenges of their early beginnings. So the origin stories inspire us and also they instill in us this hope because they make us feel like we have somehow found the, the, the one to trust that we have found the one that we can now follow. And then possibly, if we're lucky enough, we too might be able to become a little bit like them. See, I think our attachment to origin stories in our culture reveals a deep craving for a hero. We, all of us, are just looking for someone to believe in. The problem, of course, if you pay attention to the trajectory of these origin stories, the problem is that most of them actually fail to deliver. We find out later on that the challenges that they had to overcome were fabricated, that it wasn't quite the garage scenario to the Silicon Valley, but it was something a little bit different than that. So we find out that maybe everything's not cracked up as it was, or even if there was some truth there, then we find that later on the individual or the company or the organization is going to sell out or betray some of those basic foundational principles that drew you to the organization in the first place. And so our sense of hope always falls short we believe and entrust ourselves to these mythical origin stories. But Jesus' origin story is different. Jesus' origin story is different. And so John writes to us this morning because he is convinced that Jesus is actually the real deal. He's actually one that we can hope in, that we can and ought to entrust ourselves to. And so John eagerly introduces us to Jesus this morning so that even now you can trust him. So that even now you can start to put your hope and your belief in Jesus. Even though we're going to spend weeks reading through the rest of the gospel, John wants even now, at the very beginning of the story, to inspire your faith. 
And so now, brothers and sisters, let me invite you. I think Pastor Jimmy started the service really well by saying many of us experience some sort of darkness. Uh, Many of us have challenges this week as we come into worship, uh, which doesn't mean that we don't have joy. There's lots to be happy about, but it does mean that we all uh, at various times in our lives feel assailed by many different things. And so as the light shines into those dark places in our lives, let me invite you to put them aside for a minute. Just put them aside and spend the next few minutes as I read the scriptures enjoying the message about Jesus. Just listen to this important word about this most important person. Please hear with me John chapter 1. We're going to be hearing verses 1 through 18. Here's what John writes. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but... To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace And truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Brothers and sisters, thus far in the reading of God's holy word, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Our Lord and King and Master and the light of our souls, thank you so much for the glories of this passage. And I pray now that we uh, would receive illumination from you, that your Holy Spirit would shine through this word to illuminate it to our souls so that we would be able to apprehend your glory and so that we would be able to trust in you. Please generate in us, through a powerful act of the Holy Spirit, please generate in us faith so that we would believe you, so that we would trust in Christ alone as our Savior and as our hope. So please give us this hope now, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, the passage that we just read is often called the prologue to John's gospel because it sets the trajectory for the entire rest of the book. John is a master narrator, and so he front loads his book with a bunch of different concepts and themes that are going to be worked out throughout the rest of the story, themes like light, life, glory, truth, witness, belief. Conflict, revelation, John is going to repeat these themes over and over again to get his message across. And so in some ways, that's just full disclosure. There's going to be a lot that we're going to hear that sounds pretty familiar. And so if you start getting bored, or if at some week, you know, in the future, you start saying things like, I thought we heard this last week, just remember what John's trying to do. Again, he is a master narrator with one point. He wants us to believe. He wants us to believe Jesus Christ 
as the full revelation of God's glory and our Savior. And so again, he's going to repeat these themes over and over again because he desperately wants every single person to, that hears his message, he wants them to believe. And he starts... In this message, this book that engages belief, he starts by engaging a live question in the hearts of his listeners. He knows his listeners very well, and especially the first audience that he was writing to, and he knows that they are waiting for a savior. As we look through the book, and as many people have discussed who John was written to, I think the best way of thinking about the letter of John, or the gospel of John, this book, is that it was written originally for first century Jews, because John wanted to convince them in particular as a group that Jesus was the Messiah that they were waiting for. Now, of course, he doesn't come right on out and say that. Uh, We don't have, like these days, sort of uh, an introduction to the book. Uh, You know, you crack open the first page of the hardcover that you just bought. It says, I wrote this book for this reason. John doesn't tell us explicitly, I wrote this book to evangelize the Jews. But we can narrow down his audience just by asking this question. Which first century group uh, would be immediately grasped by the language that John writes at the very beginning of the book. Who would be immediately hooked by the words that he uses? The book opens like this. In the beginning. And students of the Bible, as you, you probably know this. That sounds familiar, right? That's how the very first book of the Bible opens, the book of Genesis. It opens with these words, in the beginning. And so John is explicitly rooting the story of Jesus into the Old Testament narrative of creation. And that would make sense if he's trying to convince the Jews about Jesus. Verse 1 continues. It goes on to say, in the beginning was the word. And that also would be a pretty familiar concept to students of the Old Testament. The Old Testament consistently depicts God's word in personified language. When you read the Old Testament, you hear very clearly that God's word is a powerful and authoritative force. The word of God creates. Psalm 36, or 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. So God's word creates. God's word saves. Psalm 107 verse 20 says, He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. And so when John says in verse 3 uh, that, uh, that all things were made through him, or he says in verse 10 that the world was made through him, or even in verse 12 that the, this word of God has the capacity to save, uh, that the, the people would understand what he's talking about. And so it's almost like John is saying, look, you know the word of God. You know God's word, but let me tell you something a little bit more. Let's go a little bit deeper. This word is a person. This word is Jesus Christ. And so all of this explains also why John would use the language of tabernacling to describe the incarnation, Jesus taking on flesh. If we look at verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt literally means to set up a tent Just like in the Old Testament, how God set up a tent among his people where his glory could dwell in their midst. And so John is saying, Jesus has done the very same thing. He has set up a tent in our midst where his glory will dwell. And it is his very body, him taking on flesh, that is his coming near and drawing near to us. And finally, this would explain why John compares Jesus with Moses. Again, if, if he was writing to a different people, we, some of these verses would seem kind of out of left field, but here he says, he compares Jesus with Moses, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And it also seems like John is engaging the story of Moses when he says in verse 18, no one has ever seen God. Well, yeah, no one has ever seen God. People who read the Old Testament would know that. That was established in Exodus 33. Moses begged God to show him his glory, and God said, I'll show you my glory from a distance. You cannot see my face. And so a Jewish audience would agree. No one has ever seen God. But then John moves on to say, but in Jesus you can. 
In Jesus, you can see the glory of God. And so the Gospel of John feels like an apologetic work aimed primarily at converting first century Jewish listeners. And here's how John goes about his work of evangelism. He taps into their deep, deep desire for someone to believe in. The first century Jewish context that John is writing into was a very religiously charged environment. People everywhere were looking for a savior. They had profound messianic longings. They were looking for the Messiah. And we can understand why. We just finished the book of Malachi. And so if you were following along with the the sermon series on the book of Malachi, you would have heard this is God's last prophetic word to his people for 400 years. And in it, he promises a Messiah, a Redeemer, someone who is going to come and save his people. And so as the people waited and waited, their longing grew more and more. And so they were constantly looking around for this Messiah. And at numerous points in history, various messianic figures rose up. And so the people would wonder, is this the one? Is this the one we've been waiting for? And so by the time John wrote, history was littered with false messiahs who did not come through on those hopes. And so John writes, this is the one. This is the one you've been waiting for. The savior that you've been waiting for is Jesus. And that also explains this double reference to John the Baptist that we hear in verses 6 and on, and then also in 15. When when John the writer says there's a man named John, he's talking about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was well known among the Jewish people at that time. Uh, There was intense interest in John because some people thought that maybe he was the Messiah that they'd been waiting for. And so, twice in this passage... John the writer tells us what John the Baptist thought about himself. No, he was not the long-awaited Messiah, but he pointed to the long-awaited Messiah, Jesus. Jesus is the Savior that you have been waiting for. And not only that, he's not just the Savior you've been waiting for, but he's also the Savior that you need so Desperately, the people at that time tended to crave a political savior, someone who could save them from oppression, from foreign rulers, but they often forgot about their greater and deeper need for a spiritual savior to save them from the tyranny of sin. And so John's prologue hints at this deeper spiritual need in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness. And at that point in time, we might be thinking, oh, the darkness of creation. You know, God spoke light into the darkness. So the light shines in the darkness. But then he says a curious thing, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's kind of a strange turn in the first five verses of the book, and it, it hints at some deeper conflict between the light of God's word, the ministry of God's word, and some sort of spiritual darkness. There's conflict, there's opposition that's happening here. And then John goes on to confirm that, verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. As we'll see in the coming weeks, often when John uses the word world, It has a lot of negative connotations. The world, for John, tends to be the realm or the sphere of human rebellion and human sin. And so in keeping with the spiritual darkness of the world, the world rejected God's Savior. And even more ominously, God's people also rejected God's Savior. Verse 11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. That's the language of coming to your own place, your own home, and being rejected by the people that should know you the most. It'd be like if I came home one day, and I rang the doorbell, knocked on the door, and my kids answered the door and said uh, very loudly, we don't know who you are, you can't come in here, and then boom, slammed the door in my face. Now, that's the reaction that Jesus, re- that, that, uh, Jesus received, the reception that Jesus received, and that reaction from the people to reject the one that they should have been wanting and should have been seeing, it reveals a tremendous spiritual need. 
There's sin that Jesus needs to overcome. And so the people long for a savior, and boy, do they need one. And so John writes to persuade people, the one that you've been waiting for and the one that you need is here. It is Jesus. And that's an incredibly relevant message for us these days because our own world is spiritually charged and people everywhere are longing for a savior. They might not say it as directly as this first century group, but if you look around, you'll see profound spiritual longing everywhere. That's why we crave a good origin story. It's why we want to support good causes, why we wear the names of sports stars on our shirts. We're looking for something or someone to believe in who can give us meaning and fulfillment and hope. And marketers know this about us. And they're geniuses at being able to embed spiritual significance into our everyday purchases to try and convince us that we can find spiritual fulfillment through the things that we buy. Hope is just one purchase away. Tara Barton writes about this in her book, Strange Rites, New Religions for a Godless World. Uh, She says, I noticed a giant sign at my local bus stop assuring me that You made it to this very spot at this very moment. There is a reason for everything. It was a billboard trying to sell me oat milk. Like John's audience, our world is filled with false messiahs making empty promises about earthly salvation when what we really want and what we really need is a spiritual savior to rescue us from sin and restore us to God. Like them, we're waiting on a savior. And praise God we have one. What a savior we have. Jesus is a truly glorious Savior. No other substitute Savior can stand toe-to-toe with Christ. Only Jesus can give us what we crave. First of all, Jesus shows us God. We all have this deep desire to know God, and Jesus radiates God's glory like no one else. Just listen to the verses that describe this. In John, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, verses 4 and 5. Or verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Verse 14, we've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at the Father's side, he has has made him known. That's what makes Jesus different from any other religious leader or any other spiritual guide. He doesn't show you the way to a God who is out there. No, he radiates God's glory, power, abundance, grace, and truth from within. It's like the difference between a light bulb and a live coal. Uh, I've got a light bulb here. So this light bulb can shine forth light, right? But only when it's connected to an external power source. The only way this thing works is if something else can illuminate it or empower it. But then imagine if I had a live coal up here, a burning, bright, live coal. The power could go out, the lights could go off, it could become dark. That live coal would radiate light and heat because it possesses it within itself. That's Jesus. Jesus doesn't just point us to God. Jesus shows us God from within himself. Jesus shows us God. Jesus also gives us access to God. At the end of the day, that's the thing that we want more than anything else, right? We want to be near God, and Jesus brings us closer to God than anyone else has ever been able to, even Moses. And that would be a challenge to, again, the first century Jewish hearers, but it's clear in this passage, Jesus is superior to Moses. Moses was a servant of God, but Jesus is the Son of God. 
Moses was close to God, but Jesus, as we hear in verse 1, was with God before the creation of the world. And in verse 18, we hear that he was at the Father's side, which another way of translating it would be in the Father's bosom. It's a language of intense intimacy. Moses could only see God's glory from a distance, but Jesus possesses God's glory within himself. Moses had to keep the people away from God's glory, but Jesus reveals God's fullness to us. He brings us close to God and brings God close to us. And that's why verse 16 says, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Now, a better translation of that might actually be grace after grace. Like Jesus brings us a grace that follows on to grace, or he takes us to a, another level of grace. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, meaning that the Old Testament law had a certain measure of grace that was given to us, but, it, but Jesus Christ brings us grace and truth, meaning that surpassing grace, grace after grace, surpassing grace is found in Jesus Christ, the grace of being uh, able to come near to God, to have unprecedented access to God's glory. And what else should we expect from someone who says that he can make us children of God? See, Moses could teach the people that they were children of God, but Jesus makes us children of God. Verse 12, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. No one else can do this. No other person or thing can fulfill the deep need that we have to have God, to be near to God. Only Jesus gives us access to God. And so only Jesus shows us God. He actually shows us who God is. And only Jesus can give us access to God. He actually can help us live in his presence. And he can do all of these things because he is God. Jesus is God. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Or verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at the Father's side, he, this only God, has made him known. Those are amazing statements that, that kind of blow our minds. It expands our understanding of who God is beyond the limits of our comprehension. Just think about it. The Old Testament showed us that there is one God alone. But what these verses say is that within the one God, there are some distinct persons. Jesus is fully God. The word was God, and yet in some way he was mysteriously with God. And so again, apparently within God, there is both Father and Son, and as we see in the rest of the scriptures, also Spirit. And so God is one God, but three persons, Father, Son, Spirit, coexisting together from all eternity. That is an astounding revelation. And then John makes another astounding revelation. The Son, who is himself fully God, so intimate with the Father that he can say he was sharing in his glory in the very bosom of the Father, this Son takes on flesh, becoming fully human in order to save us. In his flesh, Jesus will bear our sins on the cross. In his flesh, he shares our own sorrows. In his flesh, he brings God's glory to us so that we can see God and know God and belong to God as his children. Again, no one else can make this claim. No other religion, no other guru, no fitness studio, no hobby, no political leader, no romantic partner, no product can give you what Jesus can give you. Everything and everyone else in the entire world will fail to give you what you really want and what you really need except for Jesus. Jesus Christ, the God-man. What a Savior. What a Savior we have in Christ. And so what now? 
what now? What do we do with this amazing revelation that John gives to us? We have an intense longing for a Savior, and the answer to that intense longing is here. It is Jesus Christ, our glorious Savior. And so what should we do in response? Believe. We need to believe. That's the only right response, and it is full of grace. We don't need to buy in. We don't need to empty our savings accounts or take a second mortgage in order to convince someone to let us into this organization so we can have access to the power there. We don't have to wear the right brand. We we don't have to speak a certain language in order to get in the in crowd. We don't need to stand in line for hours just hoping to catch a glimpse of this person. John tells us that all we need to do is believe. And he unpacks that for us in a couple ways. We need to believe, first of all, the testimony about Jesus. God always sends witnesses, and there are two witnesses in this text that we need to pay attention to, John the Baptist and John the Apostle. Verse 7 says that John the Baptist came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Now, we'll hear more about John's testimony next week. But here are the cliff notes to John's testimony. He says that Jesus is the Messiah and that we should follow him. Uh, So John the Baptist wants us to believe his testimony. Jesus is the Messiah. Also, John the Apostle speaks in this text. Verse 14, we have seen his glory. That we, in verse 14, has the ring of an eyewitness account. And we believe that John the Apostle one of Jesus' closest disciples, was the one to write this book. And so he is uniquely qualified to testify about uh, Jesus' amazing glory and Jesus' saving work. And so he wrote this letter to persuade people to believe. And so the first thing you need to do is to believe the testimony about Jesus given in the Bible. Jesus was fully God. He was fully human. He really lived. He really healed the sick. He really raised the dead. He really died on the cross for our sins. And he really was raised to life again so that we could live with him forever. The Bible says that all of this is true. And so you need to believe it. Believe the testimony about Jesus And believing the word about him will then lead you to personally believing in him. This is the second thing, and it's more than just an intellectual agreement that history says this guy lived. No, this is a heart-level commitment and belief that this man saves. Now, some scholars, if you kind of break down verses 1 through 18, some scholars see a substructure in it to help us get this point that John wants us to believe in in Jesus. So they kind of break down this, uh, these 18 verses kind of like an arrow in five different parts. And so the first part has a parallel with the last part. And then the second part has a parallel with the fourth part. And that leaves the third part with no parallel. And if you study that again, that arrow, that tip of the arrow, that is the point. That is the heart of this passage. And that tip of the arrow, the heart of this passage is verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is the core message of John's book. Believe in Jesus. Trust in Jesus so that you can become a child of God. And like everything else here, salvation is a gift of grace. Your faith is a gift from God. It's part of God's will. God wants to make you his child, and so he gives you the faith so that you can believe as a free gift. So believe the testimony about Jesus, and then believe in him personally as your Savior. And so that means that if you are currently waiting for a Messiah to come and save you, you can stop looking because you found it. You found Jesus Christ. It's, it, he is your savior. And so trust in him. And that means that if you are currently trusting in another Messiah to save you, whether it's another religion or some other form of spirituality or some activity that you hope will bring you some sense of personal satisfaction or meaning, then you need to turn away from those false messiahs and trust the real one. 
Trust in Jesus Christ as the only one who can really give you what your soul most needs. And that means that if you personally trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you need to trust in him fully. You need to believe only in him. You see, even the most faithful Christian, all of us, if you kind of cornered us and had this deep heart level conversation, all of us have something in our life, something that we deeply cherish in our hearts that functions as kind of a minor Christ substitute or almost like a Christ supplement. It's the thing in your life that tempts you to say, Jesus saves my soul, but this thing saves my life. This thing preserves my happiness. And John calls us all, Christians, not yet Christians alike, to exclusively trust in Jesus as our Savior. Trust in him exclusively and fully. And so this week, please examine your life. Where are you at in your quest to find a Savior? We all long for one, and so where are you at in that journey? Look at your actions Look at your thoughts, look at your spending habits, or look at your words towards other people. What do these things say about who you actually believe in and who you trust to bring you salvation? Think of those things. And then think about our glorious Savior, Jesus Christ, who abundantly meets our desires and all of our needs. Consider him and then trust him. Believe in him. See, we all love a good origin story. We all long for that something to show us a hero that we can believe in. Now for me, one of my favorite origin stories would probably be a Netflix's version of the comic book story hero Daredevil. Uh, now season one, I, I think is just one of the best origin stories that's around. Uh, season one introduces us to Matt Murdock, who is lawyer by day and hero at night. He is blind, but he is able to do amazing things because of his hypersensitive hearing. And so what better way to show us this heroic person than putting him into an overwhelming battle? That's something that can make us believe in this hero. And so early in the season, in episode two, Daredevil goes out to rescue a boy who's in trouble. But standing between him and the boy is an entire gang. And it's going to be a tough battle. But Daredevil's mission is clear. He needs to help the helpless. And so he advances. He draws near, fighting his way through what feels like at least a dozen men. The darkness closes in. It doesn't look like he's going to make it, but then he prevails. He rallies his strength. He defeats the evildoers. He is wounded, but he's victorious. And he takes a moment to catch his breath, and then he goes in and rescues the child, saying, I know you're scared, but I'm here to help you. You don't need to be scared anymore. Let's get you home to your dad. Friends, this is what Jesus does for us. This is Jesus' salvation for us, and his story makes daredevils pale in comparison. Jesus was the light of life. The entire world was created through him. He was in the bosom of the Father, but he entered into the darkness of this world to save those who were in bondage to sin. The darkness tried to ambush him. It tried to snuff out the light, but the darkness could not overcome him. He rose victorious from the grave, shining forth with God's power and love and grace so that he could rescue us, so that he could tell every single one of us, so that he could say to you, you don't need to be scared anymore. I am here to help you. Let's get you home to your dad your heavenly father who loves you and brings you close in his arms as his children. That is the glorious savior that, G that John introduces to us today. This is a hero that you can believe in. Jesus is the savior you've been waiting for and so trust him. Trust him and enjoy being a child of God through Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this message of grace, that you draw us near, that you have sent the long-awaited rescuer. And so we pray that you would give us faith. 
In our own time, it seems that the, the darkness closes in still, and we long for Christ's second coming to come and fully pull us out of our despair and our night. And so we pray that the Holy Spirit would confirm that Jesus is our Savior. When our belief and faith grows weak, Lord, would you strengthen us with hope? And would you teach us the truth about your Son? Jesus, we praise you this morning for your heroic ability, for your very, being very God and very human. Thank you for all of these things. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your power. And we ask that you would be near to us as children of God. Through your Holy Spirit and through the grace of Christ, we have the confidence to pray these things. Amen.